what gain is there to be had from looking at some upcoming travel plans of a few people? It is an understandable question. A passage like this seems to be a big letdown after the things that we have just been reading about, right? Christ's ultimate humiliation and then his ultimate exaltation, as we saw in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Or having just read the theologically rich passage of us working out our salvation because God is working and willing within us. That was Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Or having just been convicted after reading verses 14 through 16, in which Paul commands us to do all things without grumbling. And so after all of these theologically rich contents and passages, and there are these practical commands, we then run into this passage describing travel plans of a few men that seemingly come out of nowhere. What are we to do with such a passage? Gloss it over and move on to chapter 3? No, not quite. You knew that was the answer. It turns out that Paul intentionally puts these travel plans here, right at this point of the letter, for a specific reason. Typically, Paul would put uh, upcoming travel plans at the end of his letters. At the end of his letters, he'll say, oh, and this person is coming to you or I'm coming to you, but not here. In Philippians, he puts it right in the middle. And the reason is because the travel plans are not, that is, is not the thing that is of most importance, but rather it is the men in those travel plans that are the most important thing. And I think this is how this passage, which seems out of place, connects to the rest of chapter 2. Remember, so far in Philippians 2, Paul has commanded the Philippians to count others more significant than themselves, to look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. What we, we see that in verses uh, uh, 2 and 3 of Philippians, excuse me, 3 and 4 of Philippians chapter 2. And this commitment to humility is supremely demonstrated in Christ, as we saw in verses 6 through 11. But then, Paul gives us three more models of humility in chapter 2. Namely, Paul himself, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. Philippians chapter 2 makes clear that these three men are, mo are modeling Christ-like Philippians 2, 3, and 4 humility and are following in the footsteps of Jesus. And so, in this passage, from verses 17 through 30, I believe Paul is switching from instructions and imperatives to living illustrations. He has spent a lot of time laying down the groundwork and the framework in verses 1 through 16, which included the, the, the putting up of the ultimate model of humility, Christ, but now here in our passage, Paul points to these three men in particular, himself, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, as models of humility for us to follow. And so, today in our sermon, we will look at each of these three men and how they demonstrate Christ-like Philippians 2, 3, and 4 humility. One pastor and theologian said that much Christian character is as much caught as taught, that is, picked up by constant association with mature Christians. My hope is that we would learn from the examples of these humble men and follow them as they follow Christ. And so let's start off by looking at Paul, Paul himself, in verses 16 through 18. We'll read those verses again. Paul writes, I'm going to actually paraphrase verses 14 through 16 because 16 is in the middle of a sentence. So Paul writes, effectively starting in verse 14, do all things without grumbling in order that you may shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, 
by holding fast to the word of life, here comes the change, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's stop there. So there is a pretty noticeable shift, as I indicated, in the middle of verse 16. Verse 12, all the way to verse 16, has been about instructing the Philippians about what they should do and how they live as followers of Christ. But in the middle of verse 16, Paul suddenly shifts the spotlight off of the Philippians and seemingly onto himself, so to speak. He says that the result, the result of the Philippians shining as lights in this world by holding fast to the word of life, the result of them doing that is that he, Paul, may be proud in the day of Christ. When Christ returns, Paul is saying that their shining as lights will result in him being able to boast that he did not labor in vain among the Philippians. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Pastor Jim, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to explain how Paul is being humble, and yet here he is saying, I'm going to be proud. This doesn't really seem like an example of humility to me. Fair question. Let me try to explain why I think that this is ultimately an example of Christ-like humility. How is Paul being proud in the day of Christ that he did not labor in vain, how is that an example of humility? Well, remember that Paul's labor among the Philippians was not for his selfish gain. He was not laboring among them in order to receive the praise and the commendation of the Philippians. Rather, he was working hard among them, teaching them the word in order that they may live as citizens of heaven in a manner worthy of the gospel. He was toiling among them in order that they may shine as lights in this crooked and twisted generation. He was teaching them to shine, to bring glory to God and to God alone. And we know from Acts chapter 16, you can read it later today, that Paul suffered greatly while he ministered among the Philippians. He was publicly beaten. He was put in jail unjustly. None of his labor among the Philippians was for selfish gain and admiration. His work among the Philippians was selfless and a sacrificial labor of love. Paul most certainly was looking more to the Philippians' interests than he was his own. But that still doesn't exactly answer the question of Paul's boasting or pride at Jesus' second coming. How is Paul's pride not in contradiction to his humility? Well, Paul's boasting is not in himself, but in the grace of God. It is God who supplied Paul with the grace and the means to labor among the Philippians. It is God and his grace that sustained Paul as he was publicly beaten and humiliated in Philippi. It was God's grace that sustained Paul as he toiled among the Philippians. And thus, on the day of Christ's return, Paul's labor will prove to have not been in vain, and he will boast in the grace of Christ, not in his own ability. Paul's humility 
is further detailed in verse 17. Now, verse 17 is rather complicated. The grammar is kind of weird. But what it essentially means is that it, it is the following. Paul is saying something to the effect of even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, that is, even if, if I'm to deny myself over and over again, even if, if I am to sacrificially suffer, even if I am to die, even if I'm to deny myself, suffer and die, but if as a result, your faith grows stronger, then I am glad and I rejoice with you in the strengthening of your faith. Paul is so concerned about the Philippians that he would gladly suffer in order that they may grow in their faith. That, brothers and sisters, is someone who is living out Philippians 2, 3, and 4, humility. Paul is most certainly counting the Philippians more significant than himself. He is looking to their interest above his own. Paul is a model of this Christ-like humility. And so, follow Paul as he follows Christ. And so that is Paul himself as a model of humility, putting others' interests above his own. Now let's keep going and see how Paul puts forth Timothy as another model of Christ-like humility. Let's read verses 19 through 24 now. All eyes back in the Bible. Keep those Bibles open, starting in verse 19 of chapter 2. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know how Ti but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it goes how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I short that shortly I myself will come also. And so Timothy is a young man who has been a close confidant and partner with Paul in the gospel. He has accompanied him on many of his missionary journeys, and he is a man whom Paul loves dearly. He considers Timothy as his spiritual son, as we see in verse 22. He loves Timothy, Timothy so much that years later, when Paul's in another prison cell, awaiting now his execution, he writes to Timothy in, in what we have recorded as 2 Timothy. He writes to Timothy and tells him to come to him quickly, presumably because he wants to see him and be comforted by him one last time as his death is imminent. And so Timothy is an elder and a teacher who shepherds the churches that he has been sent to, one of which is the church in Philippi. Now, how does Paul describe Timothy in this passage? Well, in verse 20, Paul says that Timothy is genuinely concerned with your welfare, or more literally, genuinely concerned with your interests or your things. It should immediately remind us of Philippians 2, 4, where Paul writes, Let each of you look not only to your own interests or your things, but also to the interests or things of others. Paul continues in verse 21. He says, For they all seek their own interests. Sound familiar? Not those of Jesus Christ. Now as a side note, who is Paul referring to here as the they? They are those in Rome, not those in Philippi, but those in Rome who are proclaiming Christ from selfish ambition. If you remember, we 
we looked at that and we studied that all the way back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, which was what? I don't know, three months ago? But when we looked at 117, they talked about those who are preaching the gospel from selfish ambition. And those are the they, right? Those are the they that Paul is talking about in verse uh, 21. So these people in Rome are selfish, self, are, are, are acting in a selfish, self-seeking manner, and they are not seeking the interests of Christ. You see, you seek the interests of Christ when you put others' interests above your own. That's what Paul is trying to say. When they are seeking their own interests, they're not seeking the interests of Christ. If you seek the interests of Christ, then you are therefore putting the interests of others above your own. And so we have here Timothy. Timothy, who is genuinely and authentically concerned about the interests of others. He is a living model of what it means to live out Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. He is working hard to not elevate his own name, but rather to count others more significant. He is working hard to humble himself and put others' interests above his own. Does this describe you? Are you genuinely concerned with the welfare of of others. We all look to our own interests. Our own financial matters, our own family, our own health, our own comfort. But do we count others more significant than ourselves and genuinely look to the financial matters, family, health, and comfort of others? Timothy is a model for us of Christ-like Philippians 2, 3, and 4 humility. And so follow Timothy as he follows Christ. Okay. So we've looked at Paul. We've looked at Timothy. And we've seen that they are both models of Christ-like humility. Now let's look at Epaphroditus as another model of this type of humility. This is in verses 25 through 30. All eyes back in the Bible, starting in verse 25 of Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to me, to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious to receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Well, first off, who is Epaphroditus? Well, Epaphroditus is a messenger from Philippi. He was a messenger and courier from the city of Philippi who brought this sizable monetary gift from the Philippians to Paul while he was in prison. You see, the Philippians heard that Paul was suffering in prison, and so they gathered this large sum of money, and they entrusted that money to Epaphroditus to bring to Paul while he was in Rome imprisoned. So Epaphroditus is clearly a man that they trust. Epaphroditus was also likely a Gentile convert. Based on his name, Epaphroditus uh, 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 was of Gentile origin. The name Epaphroditus is derived from Epaphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. And so it is reasonable to conclude that this man was not only a Gentile, but was an idol worshiper. That is, 
so Christ got hold of his heart, transformed him, and turned him into this trustworthy man of God that we read about here in Philippians. That's part of Epaphroditus' story. Epaphroditus is also a fellow worker and fellow soldier. Paul is commending this brother in Christ as someone who has labored side by side, labored for the sake of the gospel. He is a soldier who fights for the faith, enduring through spiritual warfare, resisting spiritual attacks of the enemy. These are some high compliments coming from Paul to be labeled fellow worker, fellow soldier. And so this is who Epaphroditus is. Now, how is Paul lifting him up as an example of humility? How is he demonstrating Philippians 2, 3, and 4 humility? Well, Epaphroditus' humility is seen in his great concern for the Philippians above his own needs. The text makes that abundantly clear that Epaphroditus was sick. We don't know when he got sick, whether it was on his way to Rome or whether it was when he was in Rome, and we don't know what he was sick with. We do know, though, that he was so sick that he almost died. He was on death's door. Paul says in verse 27 that he was ill, near to death. And in verse 30, Epaphroditus nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life. And so it is clear that Epaphroditus is willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. But it is also clear that he exemplifies Christ-like humility found in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. How so? Look at verse 26 again. In verse 26, Paul writes, For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard he was ill. Epaphroditus was distressed because he heard that the Philippians heard that he was ill. It is worth noting that that verb, distressed, is used only one other time in the New Testament. You want to know where that is? When Jesus was distressed in the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before his betrayal, arrest, and subsequent crucifixion. Only other time in the New Testament. Epaphroditus' distress was not light and momentary. Oh, oh, they, they probably think I'm sick. Ah, okay, well, let's move on. No, this distress was, was, was deep. It was intense. Now, why was he distressed? Was he distressed because he was so sick? Was he distressed because he was near death? Was he distressed because the Philippians didn't know that he was sick? No, he was, he was distressed because the Philippians knew that he was sick. Though he was so sick, that he was close to death. He was not concerned about his own interests. He was concerned about the interests of the Philippians. He was not concerned at all about himself. He was perhaps moments away from death. And he was more concerned that the Philippians would be anxious because he was so sick. That, brothers and sisters, is Christ-like humility. That is a demonstration of Philippians 2, 3, and 4. And so, follow Epaphroditus as he follows 
Christ. Now, I hasten to make one clarification on all three of these points before we close. I've been saying that these men, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, are models for us of humility, commended for us in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. It seems that Paul has moved from, as I said earlier, instruction and imperative to illustration. He puts forth Timothy, Epaphroditus, and himself as examples of those fulfilling these commands. And so in one sense, he is saying, be like these men. And that is sound advice. If I hang out with uh, uh, mature believers, I will naturally begin to imitate them and grow in my faith. If I read books from solid, God-glorifying, Christ-exalting pastors, authors, and theologians, I'm going to naturally be influenced in how I think and how I speak because I read those things. Now, sadly, it works also in the opposite direction. I have known, and I can tell several sad stories, of those people who are supposedly Christian, who marry non-believers, and I have seen their apparent faith dwindle to the point in which they no longer even pretend to be Christian. And so it is not a matter of if we will be influenced by others. We most certainly will be influenced by other people. And so what becomes crucially important is who you are allowing to influence you. Because who you look to as example will influence how you live. And so look to these men. Learn from them and follow their example. However, and here's the clarification, I also want to be clear that we are not ultimately to look to these men. We are not to put these men on pedestals that we are to worship. For ultimately, we are to look to Christ as the supreme example of humility. Christ perfectly exemplifies Philippians 2, 3, and 4. And I believe that if these men were alive today and here with us this morning, they would say, don't look to me. Look to Christ. I am an imperfect guy, but he, he is the perfect one. And so follow me, but only as I follow Christ. So, brothers and sisters, follow these humble men as they follow Christ. And as you work hard to follow Christ, find encouragement and motivation from these men who are modeling Christ-like humility. Let me close with this one illustration that I heard from another pastor. He said the following, to give my life for Christ appears glorious. To pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, I'll do it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. We think giving all to the Lord is like taking a $10,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us back to the bank and has us cash it in, cash in our $10,000 for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Listen to your neighbors, co listen to your neighbors or your co-workers troubles instead of making an excuse to leave. Sacrifice your time and energy to help out your church. Give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Ladle some food onto the plate of a disheveled man at a homeless shelter. Usually, giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love. 25 cents at a time. 
It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. You see, faithful Christian living, that is, living as citizens of heaven, worthy of the gospel, it involves pouring out our lives little by little in practical acts of humility. 25 cents at a time. These three men, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, modeled this lifestyle as they worked with all of their might to follow in the footsteps of their Savior Jesus they did so with daily acts of humility and so follow these humble men as they follow Christ allow me 30 more seconds to give one last example of humility there are two people here who are sadly leaving us after today, who are models of this Christ-like humility. Andrew and April, even before I arrived here, you have been models of this sort of humility. You have both always been eager to step up to the plate and serve in any way you can. And in doing so, you have frequently put others' interests above your own. Whether it is working in the sound booth or working in the children's room, whether it is signing checks or singing up at front, whether it is cutting the grass or whether it is clearing out a room, you guys have served with Christ-like humility. And so thank you, Andrew and April, for being models Philippians 2, 3, and 4 to our little church. So, brothers and sisters, the main idea of this passage is this. Follow these men as they follow Christ. And as you work with all your might to follow Christ, find encouragement, and motivation from these men in order that you may too exemplify Christ-like Philippians 2, 3, and 4 humility. Amen? Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ultimate demonstration of humility, your son Christ, who humbled himself from the throne to the dirt to the cross in order to rescue and ransom his people who have gone astray. You sent your son to die the death that we should have died in order to rescue us from the punishment that we deserve. He left the throne of heaven to come find his one lost sheep that had gone astray. We thank you, God, for Christ and his ultimate demonstration of humility. Would we first and foremost follow him? And Father, we thank you for these men, Timothy, Paul, and Epaphroditus, and their example of humility. And we ask, Father, that you would help us look to them as well as they follow Christ and would be, be encouraged by them to live likewise. And Father, I pray that you would help us to look to those in our lives, look to people who will influence us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Help us to surround ourselves among those people and to exemplify Christ-like 
humility. Father, in this all and through it all, would we glorify your name? Would we live humble lives, not so that others would say, look how humble we are, but would we live humble lives so that we would exalt Jesus above our name? Would we live in such a way that makes Christ great? So Holy Spirit, help us to do that, we pray. Father, we need you. Christ, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We ask and lift all these prayers up in your mighty name. Amen.